All right, good morning, everyone. Thanks for being here. We're um, here to talk about opportunities in improving access and creating healthier links in the food chain. Uh, just very briefly about me, I spent the first 25 years of my work life on Wall Street, uh, including 10 years uh, <coughs> working uh, for Mike at Drexel. Uh, then I jumped completely over to food, co-founding Veggie Grill in 06, which is now the country's largest plant-based restaurant chain. And believe me, that's a low bar. Uh, we, but we have served 1.3 million guests in the last 90 days alone, and the vast majority of them are meat eaters. So it's a bit of an uh, interesting factoid. I'm uh, still co-chairman there, but then uh, in order to take advantage of all the opportunities that we saw coming along in the plant-based side, I uh, moved over to the venture side, co-founded Power Plant Ventures with my Veggie Grill co-founder, T.K. Pillman, and our friend uh, Mark Rampola, who's the founder of uh, Zico Coconut Water, which he sold to Coca-Cola a few years ago. So there's obviously a lot going on. We have a terrific panel, some very diverse backgrounds. So I'm looking forward to a, a good session, and we're looking forward to questions from all of you uh, towards the end, if you don't mind. So let me start by saying a few words about each of uh, our panelists, and then I'll turn it over to the panel and spend a few minutes talking about what they're up to. Uh, and by the way, again, I, I will leave time for questions. So Dr. Dari Mozafarian is a cardi cardiologist, professor of nutrition and medicine, and dean of the Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy at Tufts University. He's authored more than 300 scientific publications on the dietary priorities to reduce cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and obesity in the U.S. and globally. Uh, Josh Stevens is president and uh, chief commercial officer of Day Two. He's an entrepreneur, investor, and advisor with a 25-year history of making positive change. Josh is an entrepreneur in residence for Health IT with Crosslink Capital in San Francisco. Uh, Matt Barnard is CEO of Plenty. He built his career leading teams to innovate with breathtaking speed and achieving complex milestones at scale. These teams designed and deployed over one billion of sophisticated technology infrastructure. Leanne Grant is the head of partnerships at Brandless.com. She has combined partnership savvy with analytics to build and scale businesses at Google, AOL, PopSugar, and Mark Plans. And interestingly enough, she has uh, completed an Ironman and four marathons, so she's the toughest, toughest one up here. <laughs> uh, Sam Polk is the co-founder and CEO of Every Table. In a prior life, Sam was a senior trader, one of the largest hedge funds in the world, so he's also a recovering Wall Street guy. He's the author of the uh, memoir, For the Love of Money, uh, and the viral front page New York Times op-ed at the same title. His writing's been published in the LA Times, Orange County Register, Huffington Post, and CNBC. So with that, I'd like to turn it over. Uh, Dari, uh, first, can you just give us a brief uh, uh, summary of what you're up to? Well, so, you know, uh, some people often ask me as a cardiologist, how did I get to, to you know, lead a, a major school of nutrition? And I said, why isn't every cardiologist, you know, interested and passionate about, about nutrition? So I think that, you know, we, we've shown that, um, you know, food is now uh, the number one cause of poor health in the, in, in the country and in the world. It's a, the number one issue for the environment. It's a major issue for disparities, for uh, challenges to economic growth, for national security. And so our school um, is uh, covering, you know, kind of the, the breadth of the food system from bench science all the way to, um, uh, you know, food systems and sustainability and, and, and climate change. And, and I think this is a really incredible time in, in nutrition where um, the public gets it, that, that this is a big issue, that our food system is broken. Um, and, uh, you know, industry um, realizes that, that business as usual is, is, is no longer okay. Um, but there's also incredible confusion. And so I think that, that you know, our mission is to really generate the trusted science to be sure we're, we're doing the right thing. And, and I think innovation is, is a crucial part of that. So it's really nice to be on this panel. And I just want to mention maybe three you know, quick, quick things that I think are really you know, innovative in, in the science of nutrition. One is just how powerful food is. I think this is a, a new recognition. And so we recently published that um, up to uh, almost 1,000 deaths per day in the United States, 1,000 deaths per day are uh, due to diet from just cardiovascular disease and, and diabetes alone. So think of if any other aspect of our economy was knowingly causing 1,000 deaths a day, 
right, what we would do, you know, we would go up in arms. Um, hundreds of billions of dollars. Um, the second, you know, big, big innovative thing that I think we're discovering is, is the power of phytochemicals, trace, trace nutrients. Um, we focused for a long time in nutrition on getting rid of additives, lowering salt, lowering sugar, but it's really about the positive power of foods um, and foods that give rise to life, phytochemicals and beans and nuts and seeds. And then I think the other thing that's really amazing in innovation is the complexity of nutrition. It's, it's so much more complex than we ever, ever dreamed. And, and you know, uh, I think that that complexity is what's causing a lot of the confusion and the science is changing so rapidly. And I think, you know, for example, we're still focused on, on calories, uh, calorie reduction, portion size reduction. I think that's, that's, a, that's a, a myth that it's all about calories. It's about foods and diet quality, how foods affect the liver, fat cells, the brain, the microbiome. And so I think we have a lot of missed opportunities the last few decades from not recognizing that, that complexity. And then I think the other final thing that's really innovative is, that we're doing at our, at our school and, and in, our, in our advocacy is understanding the best levers for prevention, and maybe I'll stop and we can move into that l l later to let others speak. But I think we actually have really good science now on what the levers should be to actually improve, improve the food system. Thanks, Terry. Sam, tell us what you're up to. Hey, everybody. Um, I run a company in Los Angeles called Every Table that's reinventing fast food to make healthy food affordable for everybody. Um, and the quick, simple structure is that we um, basically are changing the restaurant model where your standard restaurant is like 2,500 square feet of space, 10 to 15 employees, a fully built out kitchen, can cost a million dollars to build, all of which is a co high cost structure, basically. Um, we uh, have a central kitchen for all our locations. We have five locations right now, we'll have 15 by the end of the year next year. And because we have a central kitchen where every morning some of the you know, best chefs in the country are making incredibly fresh, healthy, delicious meals, and then packaging them in grab-and-go containers, um, that means that we can open locations that are 700 square feet and have uh, two employees and only cost $200,000 to build because they don't have a, a kitchen for each one. And because of that, we have this extremely low cost structure that allows us to make healthy food affordable for everybody. But of course, one of the, one of the sort of truisms of today is that what is... Affordability means different things to different people in different neighborhoods. And uh, Los Angeles is like many other urban areas where there's a great amount of sort of affluent locations um, and there's also a large amount of underserved, what are called food deserts, where there's very little access to healthy, fresh food. Um, and so what we do is we open locations in both areas and we vary the pricing to make sure that our food is legitimately affordable for everybody. So in you know, affluent locations like Santa Monica and um, Century City in downtown LA, we sell our meals for seven to eight bucks, which is a great deal versus the usual fast casual, which is you know, $13. But we also open in places like South LA, which has per capita income of $13,000 a year and life expectancy 12 years lower than Bel Air, for example. Um, and in those neighborhoods, we sell the same meals for four to five bucks. And each store is meant to be profitable, but just differently profitable to make sure that everybody has access to healthy, fresh food. Great. Josh, we give us a quick summary of what, uh, what you're doing? Sure. So uh, day two is a microbiome company. Uh, we sequence the gut microbiome um, and provide individuals, patients, consumers with a personalized diet that is unique to their uh, inventory of gut bacteria so they don't have uh, blood sugar spikes. Um, the company's a science company. We've been doing clinical trials for five years. Uh, Mayo Clinic's an investor and partner of ours on the research side, and uh, our goal and mission is to eliminate um, uh, diabetes through providing a glycemically balanced diet that's tailored to the individual, and to get in front of that as well with pre-diabetics, because we are doing that in the market today. Uh, we've done, uh, let's see, over 10,000 subjects in clinical trial, uh, million, 4 million glucose readings from continuous glucose monitors. And 50,000 meals is a data set that we use to use machine learning to predictively and accurately tell the next consumer patient how they will or will not react to specific foods and food combinations. Um, we believe the era of generic diet is over. It's about personalized diet and nutrition based on how people process food. And uh, to pick up on something Dari said, um, you know, we absolutely believe I'm a high risk cardiac patient. I get into this business as an investor and as a principal because of my own health and uh, learned from my cardiologist that sugar was the problem in my diet, excess blood sugar, that I've completely corrected without the use of pharmaceuticals over two years. 
um, and eliminated excess glucose, uh, brought my A1C down to healthy levels. Um, so we believe food is the therapy. Great. Food is the drug. Perfect. Leanne? Um, I'm Leanne, I work at Brandless, and what we do is sell everyday essentials at a fair price. Um, so what does that mean? Um, our products are high quality, so all of our food is non-GMO, we have a lot of organic food, we have over 200 products, everything from kitchen knives to quinoa puffs, we just launched vitamins um, and beauty. Um, fair price, everything's $3. So um, we, by kind of cutting out the middlemen, we're able to offer really great products to people um, at a price most can afford. Um, but we recognize that not everyone can afford that price, so we also donate a meal through a partnership with Feeding America with every order. Thank you, and Matt? Great, so at Plenty, what we do is we, uh, we engineer, design, and then launch uh, farms. So these are uh, different from the farms that most of you know. Uh, we, we develop systems for growing plants inside in a very uh, in a highly efficient and uh, you know resource efficient way. So if you um, uh, if you think about a building or a farm the size of uh, like a Walmart supercenter, this is like four and a half five acres large. Uh, we can take that and turn that into about one thousand acres of conventional field production. So it's very efficient from a from a footprint perspective, and then relative to resources, we use about one percent the water that conventional ag does on the same exact crops. Uh, so what we're, what we're working to do is, uh, first with nutrient-rich crops, so that's, that's code for fruits and vegetables, uh, is to, is to uh, increase access to those, not only here in America, but, uh, but elsewhere. We've got, you know, 4% of the world's population here, 96% elsewhere. And, uh, and while uh, uh, other good doctor mentioned the fact that we've largely solved for uh, calories and protein, um, we have a, lo a lot of work to do on nutrients. Uh, and one of the reasons I'm in this business uh, is because uh, not only did I grow up on a farm, but I m uh, personally was able to, uh, you know, with the help of some, some great uh, doctors, resolve a, a, um, an autoimmune uh, uh, condition with, uh, with nutrients, with diet, uh, and um, uh, also have, have a keen interest in how nutrition affects health and well-being. Uh, with my, my wife having been diagnosed with stage four cancer about four years ago, uh, you know, one of the things that became clear as we got into uh, what is known about how nutrition affects health is that, uh, unfortunately, we don't know as much as I wish we knew in 2017, but we do know that nutrient-rich diets are a big, uh, a big factor there. So uh, we at Plenty are working to get uh, nutrient-rich diets into everyone's budget. Thanks, Matt. While, while you're talking, I, just, I, I know Plenty is focused on growing nutrient-rich fruits and vegetables, uh, but is there a way to impact people's diets and the percentage of their diets that are comprised of these nutrient-rich foods, and is this really a supply or demand-side problem? Yeah, so we at Plenty uh, believe and are confident that it is a it is a supply-side problem. So uh, I mentioned that uh, the the U.S. population is like four percent of the world's population. We consume about thirty percent of the dollar value of fruits and vegetables that are consumed around the planet. So a hugely disproportion disproportionate consumption relative to our population and our GDP, for that matter. Uh, and that's in part because we have this combination of, uh, uh, you know, we've got one of the world's five Mediterranean climates uh, in California. Uh, the, fresh fruits and vegetables are primarily grown in Mediterranean climates because that's where they're grown most efficiently uh, in, in, in a way that they can fit into people's budgets. So we've got that. We've got an extremely efficient uh, logistics system, and we are wealthy. Uh, and the reason that matters is that because uh, there are two things that are true about fresh fruits and vegetables. Uh, one is that uh, they're the, they are categorically the most expensive calorie in the grocery store. Uh, so that, that cat catapults them into luxury uh, uh, air right away. Uh, but there's something that's more subtle than that which affects behavior uh, uh, even more. And that is the fact that you have to be able to afford to throw your money away. Uh, these are perishable products. And, uh, and so there, there have been some, some, uh, some small tests done where they took cohorts on food stamps, for example, and said, hey, we guarantee that these fresh uh, fruits and vegetables will be good in your refrigerator for a week, and if not, bring them back, we'll replace them. Uh, they found that the, the consumption of fresh fruits and vegetables skyrocketed in that cohort relative to their peers. Uh, and so this isn't just about expensive calories, this is about being able to afford to throw your money away. Uh, and so by what we're doing is pushing the production of these crops close to where people are, cutting off, 
is essentially we think about time, distance, and complexity. So we're cutting out thousands of miles off the supply chain, uh, weeks. So you know, perishable produce isn't meant to sit around for weeks or be on trucks for weeks. So, uh, so thousands of miles, weeks, and a lot of ha unnecessary handling steps. Uh, and so what that does is it just it, uh, it puts food in people's mouths that is just far more enjoyable to eat. Uh, a carrot that is, uh, that is two days old rather than six months old is a very different carrot. Uh, and so uh, you, know, you don't need uh, flavor amplifiers like salt, sugar, high fructose corn syrup when the core ingredient is bursting with a lot more flavor. Uh, so, uh, so we believe that you know, just by, uh, that by bringing delight back to these products, bringing taste and delight, uh, that people are going to choose to have a more nutrient-rich uh, diet uh, because it's fun to eat. You know, I don't want to eat a carrot that's at the store today because, gosh, that is, a, uh, that, that is one heck of a uh, boring experience. Yep. Great. Thank you. You know, it's interesting hearing Matt talk about this, Sam. I'm just thinking about what you're doing at every table. <laughs> Are you seeing the demand for the, the foods that Matt is growing in the inner city, in these food desert areas that, uh, that you have found that exist actually within um, uh, even a large city like Los Angeles? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. Um, people often assume that folks in underserved areas like to eat mostly fast food. And you know, one of the interesting things actually about the history of fast food is that <coughs> By the 60s, basically fast food franchises were only in the suburbs and uh, on highways. And then basically after the Watts unrest, the Johnson administration said, hey, there's too much social unrest in these areas. We need to create economic development. And so started guaranteeing SBA loans to entrepreneurs of color in underserved areas that primarily went to fast food franchises, not because fast food is the only food that those folks like, it's because that's the only food business that you can make work at $5 or less, or you could until now, basically. And so that is a long way of saying that, like, if you think about, like, actually, when you look at the data of um, percentage of a population that eats fast food, it, it's actually pretty similar between underserved communities, middle class, and affluent communities. Everybody likes fast food, basically. It's just that there's no other options in underserved areas. So, um, you know, and another thing to say, too, is, like, if you think about all cultures and cuisines like are by definition healthy and delicious because they've just evolved like that over time, right? Um, so yeah, that's a long way of saying there's, there's great demand for healthy food in underserved areas. You know, talking about access, um, Leanne, I'm direct this at you. How do you define access? Yeah, I mean, I think we think about access in two ways. One is, can I, can I get it? Is it local? Can I receive it at my doorstep? And then the other one is price. So kind of build off um, the conversation we've been having, what we think a lot about is like where, where is our food getting delivered? So there's all these food deserts. Um, we were really pleased to find out that within the first 48, 72 hours of us launching in July that we delivered products to 48 cont contiguous states. So this is not a coastal, um, a coastal company. We offer non-GMO foods, organic, gluten-free, vegan. Um, and from talking to our customers, um, we're really solving a problem. So I was talking to um, someone last week, he's a farmer in um, Washington, and he was saying, I, I love brandless, and I get an order every couple weeks. Um, the closest grocery store to me is an hour away, and it's Walmart, and they don't have these foods. Um, and so that's the problem we're trying to solve. Um, but we're also trying to solve the, the price problem. And so there's so much variability in prices out there for people, and so just having a standardized price helps with that. But the other thing we do is cut out um, the brand tax. So when we care, compare the prices of our products to other national brands, we're saving our customers 40% um, by going direct to the customer, by taking away all that branding from other companies. Um, and so an example of another customer I was talking to last week, he, he lives actually pretty close by. He, he lives within two blocks of a, of a Whole Foods and a Safeway. And so he can go to these stores every day um, he was the most incredible man. I think he would win at the Price is Right. He was quoting to me the price per pound of pistachios and how much lower, shelled versus unshelled, all of this stuff. And he's like, and yours is $3, and I know that by ounce. And it was just this incredible knowledge of these people who just want to save money. And we have the pistachios right outside if anybody wants them. Um, and so that's kind of the two parts of access. And then I, you know, on the price thing I mentioned before, but not everybody can afford the $3, so how can we kind of build into our DNA this 
this idea of giving back, of donating meals to the one out of four Americans that are food insecure. Great. Thanks, Liam. I, you know, Josh, I'm thinking about what, what you guys are, are doing. Um, and as our health becomes more personalized, and uh, what are innovators doing to bring this trend to food and nutrition space? And I'm going to bring Dari into this also. And is analyzing our microbiomes the key to better nutrition? So uh, I'll throw it to you first, Josh, and then Dari asks you to pile on. So we have, there's a lot of theories about the microbiome. And um, I won't speak to 99% of them because they're not yet evidence-based enough to be credible. But I will speak to the 1% of the microbiome that we're very confident um, is showing evidence and outcomes. And that is glycemic response, glycemic management how to manage blood sugar. Um, we know through uh, sequencing the gut microbiome that we can accurately manage uh, a person's blood sugar at the individual level and bring diabetics into a control rapidly. Um, we know we can do it for pre-diabetics, and we know that elite athletes started picking up our service because they wanted to have an edge in their games before game time and be balanced and not spike or trough, <coughs> a spike and then trough. Um, and so um, we know that we're there for that. We have a pipeline of other research that we believe will have promise for personalized nutrition, but, um, but for the sake of being uh, uh, prudent, we're just sticking to glycemic response for today. So Dari, do you think analyzing our microbiomes uh, could be one of the keys to better nutrition? Well, so first I think the microbiome is, is, is incredibly important for health, and so I think certainly influencing it appropriately is, 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 cent is central. Um, I think there are two uh, potential benefits to personalized nutrition companies and, and focus. One is just getting people to think about their food and eat healthier diets. And, and I'm going to guess that the range of different diets in any personalized nutrition company is still all healthy choices. So it's, it's, they're all still healthy choices and they're still far, far superior to the average diet. So just getting in one of those programs and eating healthier food is, is, is massively beneficial. And so I think that's the, the major benefit right now. When people sign up for one of these things, they commit and they're going to get a personalized diet, but that's much, much healthier than, than, than anything else. I think after that, a lot of it right now is, is hope that, that there really are these you know, important differences between people um, that could you know, be, be uh, uh, important for a lot of diseases. The evidence we have right now, on average, is that you know, whatever your genetics, whatever your background, whatever your race, whatever your education, whatever your income, there's a basic set of principles of what's a healthy diet, and there's a basic set of principles of what's an unhealthy diet, and that drives the vast differences in health across populations. And so I think, you know, um, while personalized nutrition is important, it's like saying, well, you know, there's some people who may respond to tobacco smoke and some who may not, so let's let some people smoke and let other people not smoke. I mean, that's, that's I think, around the edges from just, you know, reducing tobacco. So, so I think, you know, a long way of saying, I think that the major benefit right now of, of the companies is getting people to think about their food. Um, in the future, hopefully, we'll have more and more advances that are personalized. But right now, you know, we know what constitutes a healthy diet, and it's pretty much the same for, you know, everyone. Eat foods that give rise to life. Eat minimally processed, you know, beans, nuts, seeds, fruits, vegetables. You know, a little bit of red meat, one serving a week unprocessed, you know, or, or so. Um, reduce starch and sugar and, and salt. So that that general rule is pretty much you know true. I think for most of the human population. And Dari, just going off on that for just a second, when you talk about uh, including the consumption of, of some lean red meat, do you view that as a necessity or simply just a personal choice for? Uh, for uh, taste, flavor. yeah, it's it's absolutely not a necessity. If you look sort of structurally at what you know humans need need to consume, it's more of a of a convenient way for people to get, especially in low income countries, to get some protein, some zinc, some nutrients that are hard to get, challenging to get, you know, through through plant proteins. Um, I think that we could have successful, you know, global vegetarianism and, and veganism if you if you developed it really really carefully. But I remind people that fries and a coke are vegan. You know, sodium is vegan, trans fat is right, vegan, right. sugar sweet beverages are vegan. So, so vegan diets are not a guarantee for health. So, yeah, I think I think you know, processed meats that are are, are cured um, and Oscar Mayer wieners uh, uh, put <laughs> celery juice that is packed with ni nitrates, um, so they can say they're nitrate free because the FDA doesn't make you. If you put celery juice in your product, you can say it's nitrate free. They're packed with nitrates. So, processed meats should be avoided at all costs. I think I think you can have a healthy diet with a little bit of red meat, but it's not essential. And let's keep in mind that alcohol is vegan as well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
So Matt, what, and I, and I, and I know you're, you're spending so much time out there, and, you're, and, and by the way, congratulations. I, I know you just closed a $200 million round led by uh, SoftBank. That's uh, incredible. Thanks. Kudos to Matt. Um, so to you, what are the breakthrough ideas that, that you're seeing or that you want to see that you believe will transform our food system? Uh, well, so, um, you know, f for us, uh, we're looking for ways as we, as we work to open markets around the planet, uh, you know, in order to do what we do, uh, we need energy. And, uh, and so what we do is easiest here in the United States and in places like Northern Europe and Japan. Uh, it is actually very hard to do in most other places uh, because you need, uh, you need a supply of energy. Uh, whether that's coming from the sun or whether it's coming from uh, grid energy and, uh, and a utility plant that is centralized. Um, that even to the, to the extent that th that centralized power grid exists, um, the power coming from it is not as clean and reliable. Uh, and by clean, I mean uh, from a user standpoint, you know, a, uh, you know, a steady supply of power within a certain specification so that you are using your equipment as efficiently as possible. Um, that says nothing about what they're burning or what the, or the, the mechanism for generating the power at the, at the, at the site. Um, so for us, uh, you know, we're looking for um, you, you know, ways to deploy energy efficiently, uh, you know, kind of at the 10 megawatt scale, uh, so that we can put in uh, our farms. Uh, all over the planet. So that's, that's an innovation that we plenty specifically need to be able to drive what we want to drive and are working to drive in uh, nutrient-rich diets. So Josh, how um, do you balance innovation with making healthy more accessible? And Leanne, I'd like you to pile in on this as well. Um, it, it's, you know, that there's, when, when I think about the exciting work that you guys are doing, I, one of the things that pops into my mind is, is the, the, uh, the, the expense therein. Sure. So um, right now, the way we are approaching um, bringing the innovation to market is two ways, um, or at least three ways. There's direct to consumer. Consumers can today get sequenced and get their glycemic response for about $300. Uh, and that works for you know, the Volvo driving, Saab driving audience. Um, then there's the, the four percenters. Then there's the... Um, uh, endocrinologists have come to us saying, I want to bring this to my practice as a tool. Uh, that's the slow adoption curve that will take five years. We're going to states who are preparing for block grants for Medicare and Medicaid and giving the product um, to diabetes educators and diabetes managers so that they can reach the most population the most rapidly to actually bring health and impact to the market in the next 12 to 18 months. So it has to be a combination of some mission, I think, frankly, to the, uh, the needy because we know that the diabetes, pre-diabetes epidemic is huge with the lower income folks for all the food issues we've discussed here. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna give the innovation away to that part of the market through, um, through uh, public clinics and then go uh, cash pay to uh, individuals who can afford it like the folks here and then, uh, and then through endos for their patients. And, and by the way, I, I believe you, just, you guys just completed the financing as well, didn't you? We did. How much did you raise? Uh, we raised 17 million, um, and uh, Johnson and Johnson and Mayo Clinic joined our round. Great, congratulations! Yes. That's terrific. So, Leanne, I'd like to jump on that as well. How do you balance innovation with making healthy more accessible? Yeah, I mean, I think I touched on it a little bit before, but um, part of our mission is really dem democratizing access to goodness. Um, and so, what does that mean? It means mass mass scale, getting to as many people as possible. So, we're focused just in the U.S for now, um, but we wanna, we wanna serve as many people as possible, and that's, that's where we're focused. But I think there is definitely kind of, um, when you look at innovation and technology, you look at something like you know, supercomputers and when they were made and how expensive they were, and once you invent that great technology, like you know, some people are doing, driving down the cost of production of that. So I, I think there's room for both. We're starting mass, um, but you know, I think there's room for everyone. Yeah, great. Hey, Dari, so how and why should government and private non-food businesses prioritize food system innovation? Uh, so, yeah, I think that, you know, it's, it, it, a lot of people have talked about food over the last couple of days. Um, Cory Booker talked about it uh, incredibly last night and, and others this morning. And the question always comes back to, well, what do we need to do and how do we change the food system? And I think a lot of 
efforts so far have focused on kind of individual education and you know, traditional dietary guidelines and, and front to back labeling. But I think we need to think about systems changes a little bit more. And if you could bring up slide eight, um, this is an example, Kevin, that you thought would be useful to, to show. Brandon, can you bring up eight, please? Can you bring up slide eight? Um, so, so I, you know, when people talk about food, they talk about tobacco a lot. So big food is like big tobacco. I don't think that's the right analogy. With tobacco, it's a fight to the death. And with food companies, the vast majority of them, small and large, want to be able to sell healthier food as long as they can make a profit and, and not go out of business. And so I think a better example is, is cars and how we achieved car safety. And this is a graph. The blue is the, the deaths per mile, per million miles uh, over the 20th century. And you can see that over the 20th century, there was a 90% reduction in deaths per million vehicle miles traveled, even while the green, the, the number of cars and vehicle miles went way up. So how did we achieve this incredible public health success, this dramatic improvement in car safety? Did we do it by focusing just on the driver, just on the, you know, the consumer, and just giving them guidance and giving them knowledge and giving them information and hoping they would you know, drive more safely? No, you know, that, that's not what we did. If you can go to the next slide. Um, so, you know, what we really did for public health success is we had systems approaches. And you can think of any major public health success we've had, whether it's water and sanitation or vaccines or, or um, you know, occupational safety, it's all through systems changes. And so this is what we did to address car accidents. We did address the driver a little bit through education and licensing and then much more recently some limits on phone use and texting. But pretty much, I would say the driver today probably isn't that different from the driver in the 1930s. You know, it's probably roughly the same driver. Really, what we changed is, is the car, the product, the road, which is the environment, and the culture, especially around drunk driving. Massive changes to the car, some driven by um, um, innovation from industry, some driven by regulation, some driven by con consumer demand, huge changes to the environment. So I think this is the system's roadmap for, for changing the food system. We do need to address the consumer and, and what they know a little bit, but much more than that, we need to change the product through innovation, through regulation, through, through consumer demand. We need to change the environment, and the environment for our food system is the cafeterias, the restaurants, the farms, um, you know, the, the fast food places, um, the hotel events, right? Did we see the cookies? Did anybody see the cookies when we checked in, right? We need to change the, the, the environment. And then we need to change the culture. Here, this was around drunk driving. We need to change the culture around unhealthy eating, right? Right now, unhealthy eating is viewed as just sort of fun, um, not a big deal, no big deal if my kids have gummy bears and hot dogs after a soccer game, right? We wouldn't take them out of their car seats or not put their seatbelts on or not do other things for their health, we should really think about every food decision. And there's plenty of healthy foods that are amazingly tasty and good for you and you know, aren't, aren't gummy bears. Um, so, so I think that um, you know, we have to have systems approaches. And the, the, the three things, the, the four things that I think are probably most, would have the biggest bang for your buck is healthcare reform. So to really integrate food into the healthcare system from the electronic health record to medical education to, to billing and quality metrics, worksite wellness, um, thinking about big private companies and technology and incentives. Government industry partnerships. So as Indra Nuri said today, government has to help industry with R&D incentives and marketing incentives to develop healthier foods. And then through research, we need fundamental research. There's still so much we don't understand. I think everybody up here would say there's so much they wish they knew. And, and nationally, the federal government spends 1.5 billion a year on food research and um, compare that to 70 billion a year on just drugs and devices. So we have a huge amount of, of, of funding deficit. I'm sorry, can, 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 can I, I give me those numbers one more time? Yeah, so, so the federal government spends 1.5 billion a year on nutrition research total across all agencies, okay. FDA, USDA, and NIH. And then not the federal government, but overall in the country, we spend $70 billion a year on drugs and devices. So we're spending, you know, uh, uh, th 40 fold more on, on the drugs for the medical system than on food. And that's all nutrition research across federal agencies. Sam? Yeah, I just had a question about like systems change. I think Matt was talking about this earlier, but like one of the things that you think about when you sort of, when, when you understanding like why the food system is as it is, like for me, I think about it's basically like supply chain in some sense. Like the reason that there are so many rows in the middle of a grocery store, yeah, there's customer demand for that, but those are all shelf stable products which don't go bad. So it's such a better business, basically. And that, of course, is augmented by the fact that so much of the ingredients of that are subsidized by the federal government, basically. And then you think about also like the fast food businesses, like their supply chains are incredible, right? Like you have 
Potato, Coke doesn't go bad. Potatoes don't really go bad for a long time. And then if they start to, you can fry them and they're great. And then, you know, the beef you freeze and the, and the buns you keep in, the, you know, they're not going bad either. And so that's sort of my question about sort of like systems change. It's like, and actually it's a question for Matt too, is like, is there, the, one of the main, if fresh food is always dealing with this spoilage issue, and it's getting subsidized by the, or you know, shelf stable food is getting subsidized by the government, isn't the best way to change the system by figuring out how to flip that so that the fresh food has a price advantage versus shelf stable stuff? And like in your business, are you able to get prices down below where they're, they have been traditionally? Uh, we are, our roadmap actually shows us being a deflationary force in the price of fresh food. So, uh, you know, it is, it is uh, something that we've been working on for the better part of a decade now. Um, but, I, but what you're saying is very true, because if, if you look at just the macro, um, you know, the, the decision to eat McDonald's is, is actually quite a rational decision. Uh, I mean, um, again, to a, one of the- A rational decision. In the following way. Yeah, a rational decision in that if you have a limited budget, uh, so, so here's, here's the decision. I, I'm a human. Seek pleasure, avoid pain, uh, conserve energy, okay? And then I've got a budget. So assuming that I'm only going to buy something in my budget, uh, he, here, here's now my decision me metrics. Uh, what's convenient? Uh, what, is, uh, what, is, um, what is fun to eat? And then last comes what's healthy. We all know what's healthy. We all know we need to exercise. Uh, but, but convenience wins. And so uh, the Big Mac crushes it on calories per dollar. Uh, so you're going to solve for calories first. And, uh, and that's what the Big Mac does. Um, and so what we're working to do is to, you know, is, is to make calories and nutrients far more fun. I mean, for, talking at a systems level, the, what, what the ag and food system has done over the last half century is actually quite impressive at the scale it's been done. However, the effect it drives is that the, f the food that is best for us is both the, the most expensive and the least fun to eat. I mean, we, we had, I'll, I'll, tell, I'll tell you an, ex an experience we had to, to illustrate about a week ago, uh, a couple weeks ago, we had uh, the woman who heads all of Fresh for Whole Foods uh, come out and say uh, something to the effect of, I've done this every day of my professional life for the last three decades. I've never had kale that tastes like this. Uh, and, and, you know, because like, I, I, if you, I go to the store, I'm not going to buy kale. Uh, that stuff is a chore. Uh, but, 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 uh, but then we had, the next day, we had a board meeting. We served some of the same crops at the board meeting. I had two board members say something, almost exactly the same thing. I hate kale. I love this. One of them said, I, I feel so strongly about it. You shouldn't even call it kale because why would I ever pull that off the shelf? <laughs> because, I, you know, so, so uh, you know, there's, there's this whole strain of advertising where, you know, there's, it's usually a woman uh, holding a bowl of kale and she's laughing, presumably because she's thinking, why would I ever eat this? But, uh, uh, but the, the, when you have to solve for uh, commercial economics in the field where you have to have, be a grower growing at least 2,000 acres to be profitable, uh, that limits you to certain varietals. We don't grow the varietals that are, that are on the shelf today because they're not optimized for user experience. Uh, so we start by growing different varietals. Uh, and then you have to solve for 3,000 miles in a truck. So the only reason iceberg lettuce exists at all is because in 1940, you piled a bunch of bowling balls in a container. You piled hundreds of pounds of ice on top of them, and then you shipped that 3,000 miles across the country. So we don't have to solve for 3,000 miles because it's being produced 50 miles away. So we don't grow iceberg lettuce because it's a zero. So we grow, you know, I had Alice Waters' daughter out to the farm a couple weeks ago, and she was like, how do you get lettuce to be sweet? You know, how, how does it taste sweet? So we, we actually have nutritional content in our lettuce, uh, a shocker, and then, uh, uh, and then it actually has flavor. It's fun, it's fun to eat. So, like, systematically, this is how... I mean, because, like I said, a carrot that's six months old is just not fun to eat. And most of the carrots on the shelf, they're six-plus months old because there's only one carrot harvest a year. Uh, so, um, so that's systematically what we need to, to do is make this stuff actually fun to eat and make it convenient. So if it's drenched in pesticides, right. uh, now I've got to wash it. If it's old, it doesn't have much taste, so I need nine other ingredients. And now I'm a half hour in before I have a meal. So if it's, if it's uh, convenient, I can... Matt, thank you. That's, hey, sorry. Ke uh, Kevin. Josh, I, I, I know that you had a, a, well, a question. You know, I, I agree. Everything you said, it's only one thing I would uh, offer a friendly amendment to, which mm -hmm. is we know what is healthy. Um, we just published a paper this mm -hmm. year in Cell Biology 
that uh, showed uh, you know nutritionists and dietitians have guidelines of what is healthy mm -hmm. and what to how to advise their patients. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things they are often telling their patients is whole grains and stay away from the white um, uh, starches. Um, we proved through a double-blind trial that published and peer-reviewed that uh, brown rice spike more people than ice cream as a result of their microbiome bacteria, not as a result of the food itself. Say that one more time. Brown rice being recommended as a dark starch um, was actually spiking diabetics mm. uh, more than ice cream would mm. in a double-blinded trial published and peer-reviewed. Mm. So what we know and what we think is healthy, I think so we have general less sugar in ice cream. What's that? There's less sugar in ice cream. There's less glucose in ice cream. And yet diabetics keep, telling, uh, get, keep getting told by their nutritionists to have brown rice, not white. And so one of the things that we need to uh, be open to is the epistemology of, of what we know about food is like it's inning one. Yeah. Because we can say stuff is generically uh, valuable um, yeah. for nutrition, yeah. and that may be true, but then if you ask does it actually help your health, uh, it can be nutritious and harm you if you're a diabetic, a pre-diabetic, or if you're actually uh, sensitive to blood sugar. Mm. Uh, I wanted to, and we're getting a little bit short on time here, so I just want to jump to, uh, when I was looking through um, some of the data that uh, uh, Mike and I were talking about when we were flying out here yesterday, of course, he insisted that we leave at four o'clock in the morning from, from LA. Um, the uh, w food deserts, you know, we're, we're all talking about food deserts. And um, uh, Sam had put together some interesting data. When, when, when we talk about food desert, we assume that it's the flyover states. And uh, Brandon, would you put up uh, slide 13, please? And Sam has done some fascinating work uh, just in Los Angeles. L.A. County has 12 million people. So, um, Sam, will, will you tell us? Let's see, that is not rendering. Yeah, can you give me the thing? I can do it. Um, That's a nice shot So basically, of LA. this is like a shot of L.A., and um, L.A. has seen this, you know, incredible there boom of, you know, incredible healthy options. Well, let's, let's just pause there for the enjoy veggie grill. <laughs> But you'll know that, notice that they're uh, at certain price points and certain locations around the city. Oh, great. Thank you. And you'll notice there's a huge area left out. And that's an incredibly dense area of the city. It includes Watts, <coughs> Compton, South LA. Um, and it, it, like I said, in some neighborhoods, per capita income is $13,000 a year, which when you think about what that really means, and we do, we run a nonprofit called Grocery Ships that helps families living in food deserts um, get healthy. And basically, you, know, you see $1,200 monthly income $800 monthly rent, how do you make it to the end of the month every month, cupboards are bare. And that's why um, we price our meals. When we open stores, we have two stores in that red area and then coming soon, Watts and Compton. And in those areas, the meals are priced for four to five bucks because we're solving for convenience like what Matt was talking about and affordability and knowing that, you know, in you know, in, in West LA, you know, affordable is eight bucks and in South LA, it's, it's five bucks. Um, one of the things, and this goes back to our supply chain conversation, is one of the interesting things is that there are businesses that serve both areas really well um, and very profitably. Uh -huh. So that is the trick for us. Is you know, and the other thing I do want to say about this, by the way, is like the one thing that McDonald's and Taco Bell and all these guys did a good job of is making food that everybody likes and that works for everybody. And you know, one of the things that you see in the sort of world of like food waste. Um, is, you know, is some really well-meaning and I think wonderful ideas, but that, that are basically grounded in this idea of like, let's take the leftovers from one group and give it to another group. And I don't like that, mm -hmm. you know? I don't like that at all. Like one of the things I like about our, and even, you know, frankly, Indra sort of said this in, in, in her own way, which candidly I didn't really like, which was this, you know, that we can't get fruits and vegetables in the underserved areas, so juice will have to do, basically. But I like this idea that you know, healthy food is a human right that everybody should have access to. And one of the things about our business is that you have a central kitchen making these meals and the chefs don't know whether the, those meals are going to Watts or whether they're going to Beverly Hills, basically. Um, Thanks, Sam. Uh, by the way, I was having a conversation with an executive of one of the big food companies uh, and I was giving him a hard time about, isn't there any way to reduce uh, salt, sugar, and increase the nutritional value of some of their uh, best-selling cereals. And he said, Kevin, no sugar, no salt, no sales. <laughs> it was a brief conversation. Um, <laughs> so, uh, uh, Dari, you know, I, 
again, Mike and I were talking about this on the way out. Uh, the U.S. spends $1.4 trillion annually addressing obesity-related <coughs> health conditions, chronic disease, most of which is preventable or are preventable, are responsible for seven of 10 deaths annually in the United States. Brandon, would you put up slide number 10, please? And I think that, uh, I think that is a very important slide. And in, in order to, when we say first focus on food, Daria, I mean, how do, how do you change people's minds though? I mean, we've, we've struggled with it at Veggie Grill and we just decided we're not gonna fight the battle. We, we don't preach. We, in none of our uh, collateral do we say health, vegetarian, never vegan. And uh, we've just focused on, on, on taste and flavor and mouthfeel. And that, that's kind of carried the day for us, thank God. But how do you see it when, from, from, you know, you're, you're, the, you're the dean of one of the top schools in, in, the, in, uh, in the world in nutrition. How do you change people's uh, idea about, um, about food? Well, so I think this is where we talked about kind of, you know, systems changes. We, we, history is incredibly important. You know, we didn't get here today because of purposeful, you know, mostly, we didn't get here today because of companies purposefully trying to make unhealthy food. I and mean, we got here because the major goal in the 30s and 40s was to prevent micronutrient deficiencies, which are rampant, and to prevent hunger in this country, which is rampant. That's modern history. You know, 1930s and 1940s is modern history. And so we created a food system where foods were safe in terms of bacterial illness, were shelf stable so you didn't have wastage, and were, they were the cheapest in, in human history. And so that's why we got where we are today, not, again, a purposeful, nefarious plot, but just to try to, try to make foods that were addressing the problems of those days. Now we have completely new problems, and the food industry is changing very, very rapidly to try to address those. And, and they're, they're you know, stuck and, and have problems, and of course some companies are trying harder than others, and there's a lot of still deception and denial and some other things going on, but, but I really feel like there's, there's, there's you know, a, a way out. And I guess if we could go to slide seven, what we talked about in, in this article is that there are really best buy ways to change the system, to, to, to create stronger price incentives, so healthier foods cost less, whether it's giving retail consumer incentives, whether it's changing our government feeding programs, whether it's taxing unhealthy foods and using those funds for school lunches or other things, whether it's putting you know, um, um, foods directly centrally into the healthcare system. You know, with all the health reform debate this last year, and also eight years ago when Obamacare was debated, nobody mentioned food. How is that possible that we're having healthcare debates without mentioning food? So, so I think there are real, real ways to do this, and I'll just give one example. John Hancock, who has 1.8 million life insurance customers around the country, realized over the last 30 years that their customers are no longer dying of infection and accidents. They're dying of, of you know, mostly diet-related illness. And so John Hancock said, we're gonna make our customers live longer They'll pay us premiums longer, and we'll give some of that money back. So they give them free Apple Watches. They give them, if they, if they sign up for this insurance program called Vitality, and they give them up to $600 cash back per year for buying healthy foods. They said, we can pay them $600 a year to buy healthier foods because it helps our bottom line. And so, you know, John Hancock has realized that we need Medicare and Medicaid to start paying people for eating healthier foods. We need the government to make companies like these up here have tax breaks and marketing breaks. To, to make their you know, prices more affordable. We need more research. Um, you know, there's, there's, we have all the levers. I'm, I'm incredibly optimistic. Um, you know, and to paraphrase Michael Milken, right, that the future is not gonna be the same as the past. And so um, you know, we really have the opportunity to do this. The major obstacle is confusion and, and changing science. So that, that you know, the nutrition whiplash that Indra Nuri talked about. So is it low sugar, high sugar? Is it chocolate or no chocolate? Is it caffeine or no caffeine? We have to figure that out make it clear for, for everybody so that we have effective policies and, and industry goals. Uh, I was in a breakfast uh, this morning with, uh, with uh, Mike and there were some Congress, uh, people from Congress there, uh, scientists. Are you aware of this study that's starting with this? A million people that are gonna um, uh, basically volunteer to be monitored constantly and openly share that with the study. And it was interesting, uh, right away the, uh, the, the, a congresswoman said, well, you know, what about privacy issues and the liability? And now it's an opt-in, obviously. And Mike said, you know, I would pay $100,000 to be in that study to find out 
what's going on and for the betterment of society. And uh, he, he said, we have to stop thinking about things from a 20th century standpoint and instead think about them in a 21st century standpoint. Um, just very quickly, Matt um, and Josh, the, uh, th there's been an entry of traditional tech investors into the food and nutrition space. And how has that changed the game? And could this parallel the clean tech uh, disaster in terms of failed investments? So why don't you grab that first? Sure, it could absolutely uh, parallel the clean tech disaster. Um, <laughs> uh, um, Next question. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, the, uh, so Silicon Valley does a lot of things poorly. And uh, one of the things that um, there tends to be a herd mentality. When something's hot, everyone piles in. And while well, the Valley seems, seems to be very, and that's where I'm based, so that's my frame of reference on investing, um, mostly tech investors, hardware and software. Um, and when it comes to things outside of those realms, there's not a lot of domain expertise in the firms, and so they're going on second-hand information or friends of the firms to advise them. What I am seeing that's different and maybe special about um, health investing now um, is that when it comes to diagnostics, when it comes to therapies, um, developing new therapeutics, it's much more of a large data game than it ever was in other fields. Um, the fact that we can, uh, in our case, uh, come up with an accurate diagnostic that doctors want to use from data sets that were built up for five years, um, and we're not going to the FDA with that, we're going directly to market with that. Um, the fact that most new drugs are developed across large DNA sets and large uh, data sets that are volunteered, um, that's where most of the pipeline is coming from now. And uh, tech investors know how to invest around data. And so data, data, as long as you can get good signal off of large pools of data, um, tends to be a very good predictor to de-risk. And we're seeing a lot of uh, health IT investment go around uh, data for drug development, therapeutics, um, and uh, diagnostics. Whereas before, wet health in the labs, uh, Silicon Valley was staying away from because they didn't know lab science. Most of the lab science is now being shared in ways it hasn't before. So data is a lot more open. Labs and schools share data in ways they haven't before. Like the study you're referencing will be public domain data. That data allows product developers and allows computer scientists to actually look for signal and pattern to then find interventions. It doesn't mean they know the underlying science about why things work. It means they can actually find correlated cause-effect relationships, and that's what's happening now. That seems to be the new, the latest wave that we're seeing. Great. Matt? Yeah, I'll say uh, a, a couple things. Uh, well, I mean, first, uh, I mean, uh, markets have shown that human behavior is gonna drive boom and bust, so I, I, I'm, I'm not gonna pretend that this time could be different I expect a boom and a bust cycle here also, uh, but I think we have quite a bit of booming to go. But you know, one of the things that we did at Plenty uh, uh, in trying to learn from what happened in clean tech is um, we, we actually, when we went to raise our A round financing, which was uh, about a year and a half ago, um, uh, we had already been at it for several years and we, uh, in analyzing what happened in clean tech, we saw there's a pattern there of um, testing at bench scale, which takes a few years, and then maybe sub-production scale, and then going to production scale in what is uh, thought to be a conservative way to go about it. Unfortunately, the years that it takes to get there, you're imposing financing risk on the company because you're also not earning revenue. And you're also not learning things necessarily that are applicable to the production scale growing system. So we decided that we would only raise uh, the financing if in fact it would give us enough money to be able to uh, test and iterate an A-B test at field scale, uh, at field scale or production scale. So uh, that's uh, one of the ways that we've taken the lessons of clean tech and tried to apply that to what we're doing at Plenty. Beautiful, thank you. With that, I'm gonna, we're getting close on time here. I'd like to open it up to all of you to, if there are any uh, questions you might have for the panel. Young lady right here. Is that mic on? Oh, Great. yes, hi. Um, my name is Simone Friedman, EJF Philanthropies. Um, I manage um, both grant making as well as um, we make some impact investments in the space. I'm curious what you think about, one of the challenges that we've had is really dealing with the, um, the institutional food providers, the food service issues where we, you know, we're, we're trying to, we talk to a school, we talk to a camp, an assisted living facility. What are they serving their, their, their people, you know, how can we get them to transition to more of a plant-based mix of, mix of foods, healthier foods? 
and it seems as though there, this is a huge challenge, that it's a lot easier, there's the consumer demand, but there's something in the supply chain that I've noticed that's, I don't know if it's the distributors or what the barrier is, but really, we're, that there's so, there's so many meals that are served to these, you know, at, in these types of environments, and I don't know if anybody can speak to that. Actually, I'd like just uh, Leanne and uh, then Josh to, you want to take a, a swing at that one? Sure, yeah. So I think what, you know, what we're trying to do is make the price point accessible. We have seen a lot of people order into their offices, so not yet into schools or um, retirement homes, but um, by setting people up with kind of that like groundswell of people like bringing it into the office, that's what we've seen work well. So I've spent 10 years working with self-insured employers who pay for the meal plan at their company, as well as pay for the health care because they're self-insured. And what I learned was that the CFO uh, pays, writes the check for both vendors, for Sodexo Aramark in most cases, and for whoever the carrier is who's providing the health insurance. And when you get to the CFO and can tell her that if you actually provide more healthy food in the cafeteria over here, which you may have to subsidize because employees won't pay for it because you're not raising their wages, mm -hmm. it will lower your claims costs over here. But you'd actually have to have be programmatic and consistent and provide incentives and targeting then she will actually subsidize the Aramark program or the Sodexo program because those are the institutional purveyors of the food to the large self-insured cafeterias. But if you don't get to the person who writes the check for both healthcare and food, I think it's a losing proposition as a practical matter. Great, we have time for one more question. Gentleman right here. Uh, uh, my name is Jeffrey Davis. Uh, I'm a partner of Squire Patton Boggs. Um, Episodically, I've noticed there seems to be a generational change in tastes and consciousness of health, healthiness in that, you know, people don't buy sodas necessarily. They may prefer to buy water or they're studying more carefully what they're eating. How, how can, if, first of all, is that true? And then secondly, how can you utilize that momentum in order to uh, make it more prevalent throughout the population? Dari, you want to tackle that one? So um, there are there are there have been some some you know relatively rapid tre trends in some things, and other things haven't moved at all. And so you know sugar sweetened beverages are a great example. They've gone down thirty or forty percent in just five or six years in this country. Um, although the disparities r remain, um, gone down in all groups, but disparities remain. On the other hand, you know salt consumption hasn't changed at all. Vegetable consumption has barely budged. Um, whole fruit consumption has gone up, but just a tiny little bit. Yogurt and nuts, just a tiny little bit. So, so I think there are some some big swings that, that happen. Um, I think that you know relying on um, just consumer taste and demand to drive things would take a long time because consumers get used to whatever they grew up with. In in China, they prefer one kind of food. That's how they grow up. In some parts of the South, they prefer another kind of food because that's how they grew up. So people prefer what they they're used to. So I think we have to have the supply chain. The supply change um, and marketing be used to, to help drive that that demand, uh, and then that will then you know cycle on itself. Sugar sweetened beverages <coughs> is a relative exception, I think, because of all of the attention on sugar sweetened beverages with taxation and issues. Trans fat is another example. So you can have some big wins with with driving consumer demand, but I think mostly we have to change supply and use marketing to, to drive demand. Great. Thanks, Doug. I'm gonna, actually going to take one more. That gentleman, I promised to have him over there. I can just add on quickly to that question when you finish. Um, Gen, Gen Z um, millennials, they grew up valuing transparency so much. They had Google, they knew, they had information at their fingertips, WikiLeaks, all of that was part of their um, coming of age. So things like relevant front of the pack logos, that's what we do, but knowing where my, my food is made, knowing what's in my food is so in incredibly important to that generation. And yet you, something super encouraging, is we're, so we're working with several of the largest food and beverage companies uh, on the planet. Uh, because you know, salt, for example, is a flavor amplifier. If the if the core flavor compound is more vibrant and bold, you need less amplifier. So, I'm Ambassador Kumsen, former Ambassador of Ghana to U.S. I just got back from three African countries: Namibia, Ethiopia, and Ghana, just two weeks ago. How is how pass, how can we apply the hydroponics, the technology, the financing to really bring this to the African continent, where the return on investment can be three, four times? you know, three, four times fold. And I'm saying this from experience because a few companies that are doing hydroponics, growing vegetables, growing uh, salad leaves and other things, 
are making a killing. Unfortunately, you don't see the Americans there. I've lived there for 42 years, and I'm trying to impress American companies that are, if they take the risk and come to Africa with these kinds of you know, nutrition-dense you know, food items, they will do incredible well, and I'd be delighted to help in any Wonderful. way possible. Wonderful. Thank and you very much. If you've come to the right panel, Ambassador, because Matt over here has $200 million in his wallet. <laughs> 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 um, so, thank you. I, now I have that on my shoulder, uh, shoulders. So, so go ahead. Um, tell the ambassador no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No. I, the last time I was in Accra, I was absolutely stunned at the level of economic uh, activity there. It was, I mean, just absolutely stunning. Uh, and a place like uh, you know Accra or Nairobi, Kenya, uh, would be a fantastic place because of the both the concentration of people and the limited access to, to, to fresh nutrients. So we actually are working, I have, I have several people that, I, um, that we're talking to right now to bring into our company uh, to help us grow the business in Africa and on the Arabian Peninsula both uh, because those are uh, massive opportunities for us because the huge populations with little to no access to affordable uh, you know, fresh food. But with that, we need to stop. And the two of you, please get together after the panel. <laughs> Thank you all for coming.